Concerning the Authenticity of the Bible Part 1 Who Owns the Old Testament? A critical review of the arguments forwarded by missionaries to prove that the Bible is the absolute Word of God. Who Owns the Old Testament? A look at the way fundamental inconsistencies between the Old and New Testaments were treated. Who Owns the Old Testament Judaism or Christianity? This is a very natural question to ask, especially since the Old and New Testaments are nearly always found, in Christian practice at least, bound together as one book. Yet it is difficult to assess to what extent Christianity is sensitive to the fact that what the Church has called the Old Testament is also the property of Judaism and Jews, and that the Church by no means has a monopoly on it. Because of a strong awareness that the Old Testament is read by Jews, many people prefer to avoid altogether the term Old Testament, which is of course not used by the Jews themselves. At the heart of the matter is the fact that the term Old Testament was coined by Christians to distinguish these writings from the ever-growing literature of the early Church that began to be regarded as having religious authority. This appeared to put the Old Testament on an inferior footing to the New Testament and devalue it, a move that is felt to be insensitive to Jews. A further complication arises when we learn that the 24 books accepted as canonical by Jews and most Protestant Christians are increased to 27 by Catholics, including some books that were not originally written in Hebrew. The question of what Christians should do with the texts they had inherited from the ancient Israelites was the subject of lively debate from the earliest centuries of the Church. Fuel was added to the debate in the form of one overriding factor which Christianity had then and still needs to resolve. The existence of fundamental inconsistencies between the Old Testament and the New. The classic case of rejection of the Old Testament within Christian tradition is that of Mark Ion, a very influential churchman of the second century. He emphasized Paul's contrast between Old Testament law and New Testament gospel to an extreme degree, so much so that he rejected the whole of the Old Testament. He went so far as to claim that the loving father of the New Testament was in fact a different God from the angry God of the Old Testament. This may be a rather extreme response, but the problem is one that still worries many today. Again, the factor which led Mark Ion to reject the Old Testament was, primarily, the problem of irreconcilable discrepancies between the two Testaments. Martian's rejection of the Old Testament was deliberate. As was the rejection in the 1930s, when anti-Jewish feeling in Nazi Germany put pressure on the Church to deny the Old Testament. The form that rejection of the Old Testament often takes in modern-day Christianity is very different, amounting usually to an embarrassed silence about that part of the Bible. This attitude, which might well be said to be typical of very many Christians, is rarely articulated clearly. Of particular importance here to Christians is the supposed difficulty and obscurity of so much of the Old Testament, the apparently cruel and primitive nature of large parts of it, and also the feeling that it is irrelevant to the modern world and even contradicts the scientific views of our age. The fact that the same could be said for the New Testament is conveniently overlooked by such Christians. The alternative to rejecting or quietly ignoring the Old Testament is to affirm its importance for the Church and to attempt to integrate it with one's understanding of the New Testament. After all, what we call the Old Testament was the Bible of Jesus and of Paul, who both felt it important and relevant to quote and read from it, as the following examples highlight. At Luke 4 verse 18, Jesus, whilst visiting the synagogue as a child, is quoted as reading a passage from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Some of the words from this passage have been underlined to assist in a comparison between Luke's New Testament rendition of this quote from Isaiah and the form which it takes in the Old Testament itself, where Isaiah 61 verse 1 reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Surprisingly, the two passages differ. The Old Testament makes no mention of recovering of sight to the blind whereas Luke does. And he substitutes heal the brokenhearted and them that are bruised for the Old Testaments to bind up the brokenhearted and them that are bound. There appears to be no logical explanation for the differences, except that the text has either suffered corruption, or the Old Testament which Jesus read from is not the same as the one in use today. Here are two examples of Paul's usage of the Old Testament. Isaiah 64 verse 4 reads, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, 
what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Paul quotes this passage in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 where he says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, either have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. It is noticeable that the words underlined do not occur in Isaiah. The Bible commentary of Henry and Scott explains, The best opinion is that the Hebrew, Old Testament, text has been distorted, whereas Peake's commentary offers the following explanation. The source of the quotation is very uncertain. If from the Old Testament the points of contact are so slight that no confidence can be felt in this derivation. If the source is not the Old Testament, Paul has quoted another work under a misapprehension. Psalm 40 verses 6 to 7 reads, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. Paul reproduces this passage in Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 7, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. The misquote is clear. Peake's commentary says, page 896. As usual the writer Paul, quotes from the Septuagint which reads, But a body hast thou prepared me instead of mine ears thou hast opened, as in the Hebrew version. Henry and Scott's compilers have said, This is a mistake of the scribes. Only one of the two statements is true. By ignoring the language in which it was first revealed, as most Christians tend to do as a matter of routine. It became very easy to interpret passages from the Old Testament and mold them to conform to New Testament views. Hence, a common way of handling the Old Testament in the early church was to allegorize it. In this way many non-existent prophecies about the coming Messiah. The resurrection and even the Trinity were supposedly found in the Old Testament by Christians as proof of the correctness of their beliefs. Invariably, these became to a large extent the only texts Christians were content to quote from the Old Testament. This brought with it another problem, and which again deserves an answer. What should be the response to those cases in which the New Testament understands the old in ways that diverge from the original meaning? Particularly when the peculiarities of the original Old Testament language are ignored? The New Testament uses Old Testament material in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes the New Testament authors state explicitly that they are quoting from the Old so as to show that the events recorded in the New Testament fulfill the promises of the Old. For example the passage which Matthew quotes in his Gospel, chapter 27, verse 9. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. This excerpt turned out to be one of Matthew's best-known mistakes. The statement he ascribes to Jeremiah is not found anywhere in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. A passage similar to it, however, is found in Zechariah 11 verse 13. Horn observed in his Bible Commentary, Volume 2 pages 385-386. Some scholars think that it is an error of Matthew's version and the copier wrote Jeremiah instead of Zechariah. Or it may be a later edition. Another of Matthew's famous errors is found in his Gospel at 2.23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called Nazarene. This prophecy is not found in any of the books of the prophets in the Old Testament. Manfred, a Catholic scholar, wrote in his The Questions of the Question. The books which contain this description have been destroyed, because in any of the present books of the prophets we do not find the statement that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. Dot. Psalm 14 of the Latin and Greek translations of the Old Testament read, Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of the people of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This passage is not in the Hebrew Old Testament, nor is it found in the current English translations. Nevertheless, we find Paul quoting this passage in its entirety in the New Testament in his letter to the Romans 3 verses 13 to 18. Where did he get it from? Which version of the Old Testament was Paul using when writing his letter, and why do modern English translations not rely on the same version when reproducing Psalm 14 so as to match the usage of Paul? 
Footnotes in the New International Version attempt to piece together the statement in Romans by citing excerpts from four different Psalms in Isaiah, but the effort is hardly convincing. Particularly when we remember that the passage is quoted in its entirety in Psalm 14 of the Latin and Greek versions. Mark's Gospel highlights again the concern about the New Testament author's insufficient knowledge of the Old Testament. He states in his Gospel 2 25-26, Have you never read what David did? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the shrew bread. This is incorrect because the high priest at the time of this incident was not Abiathar but rather Ahimelech, as can be seen in the Old Testament at 1 Samuel 21 verse 1. Therefore, Peake's commentary says, page 684, the reference to Abiathar is a mistake. In view of the above comparisons, one is left a little less than fully convinced about the New Testament's handling of the Old Testament. Why were the New Testament authors unable to reproduce accurately the texts they needed from the Old Testament? And are these inaccuracies compatible with a work that claims for itself divine inspiration? Corruption of the text, Old Testament and New, is one obvious answer, something that professors of biblical exegesis have long since affirmed for the Old Testament at least. This can be seen from even a cursory look at Peake's commentary on the Bible, edited by Arthur S. Peake, once professor of biblical exegesis at the University of Manchester. It is a compilation of commentaries, articles and works by the editor himself as well as, amongst others, professors of Hebrew and Old Testament exegesis, a professor of divinity, Semitic languages, and New Testament Greek. New Testament exegesis and a professor in New Testament Greek. It was published by Thomas Nelson and Son Ltd., London, in 1919 as a single 1,014-page volume, which has the following to say about various books of the Old Testament. It says in the concluding statement to the commentary on the book of Joshua, page 255. According to critical investigation the book appears to be a medley of contradictory narratives, most of which are unhistorical. Commenting on Judges chapter 17 and 18 it states, page 269. In not a few places the text has evidently been tampered with by scribes, who took offense at practices which were from a later point of view irregular. In its commentary to 1 Samuel 2 verse 3 we read, page 275, These verses do not make sense. The present wording cannot be the original one, but must be due to mistakes in the copying. We cannot now discover the original form. Again in 1 Samuel, this time against verse 14-18, it says, page 288, the introduction of the ark in 1 Samuel 14 verse 18 is due to a corruption of the text. On page 292, commenting on 2 Samuel 23 verses 4 to 7, it states, The text and translation of the last line, and of 5 to 7, are uncertain. There is no agreement among scholars as to how they are to be restored. On page 321, in the commentary to 2 Chronicles, chapters 29 to 32, we read, The chronicler in this long section writes, from his own point of view, much that is quite unhistorical. It is probable that another source, or witness, was utilized by the chronicler but he himself is evidently responsible for many of the variations. Commenting on Ezra 4, verses 6 and 7, page 327. These are two stray verses which have been left in the text here by mistake. This offers a good example of the way in which fragments of sources are jumbled together in our book. Scholars have suggested a number of solutions, but they differ from each other considerably. In the introduction to the book of Hosea, we read, page 534. As will be apparent from the notes, the text is in places very corrupt. We must often resort to conjectural emendation, and reach only a possible approximation to the original text. Commenting on Zechariah 6 verses 9 to 15, it says, The text is considerably confused, partly through accident, partly it would seem by deliberate alteration. It would appear that Christianity's attachment to the Old Testament will continue, and along with it all of the problems highlighted above. Does the original gospel that was in Aramaic exist nowadays, and where is it? Answer. Praise be to Allah. Firstly, researchers and specialists in the study of religion and ancient history differ concerning the language spoken by the messenger Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus son of Mary, peace be upon him. Researchers are unanimously agreed that Palestine at the time of Isa was a mosaic, and that its inhabitants were a mix from every nation and language, and they spoke, to varying degrees. Hebrew and Aramaic in different dialects, as well as Greek and Latin. But differences arose among them when they tried to define the geographical borders of each of these languages. And when they wanted to find out the distinguishing features of these languages and determine to what extent they were influenced by one another. 
When we read of the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, in the four Gospels, we find that he addressed different groups of people. He addressed the masses in various cities and desert areas, and he addressed the members of the Supreme Council, Sanhedrin, and the teachers of the law, and those who were in charge of the temple and running the religious affairs of the Jews. He also addressed the Roman governor of Palestine whose language was Latin. Among the Aramaic words attributed to the Messiah, peace be upon him, in the Gospels are Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27 verse 46 He took her by the hand and said to her, Tala the comb, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Mark 5 verse 41 Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. John 20 verse 16 It seems that the discussion was in their language. But because of these different reports there was a strong difference of opinion among the scholars and researchers as to the language of the Messiah, peace be upon him. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qaim were of the view that he did not speak any language other than Hebrew. Ibn Taymiyyah said in al-Jawab al-Sahih, The Messiah was a Hebrew and did not speak anything but Hebrew. End quote. And he said, the one who says that the language of the Messiah was Aramaic or Greek is mistaken. End quote. Some of them were of the view that all the evidence shows that most of the speech of Isa, peace be upon him, was in Aramaic, which was the most widely spoken language of the people. He also spoke Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, to a lesser degree, and it seems that he was educated in Latin and Greek. See, Lughat al Masi Isa ibn Maryam by Dr. Abd al Aziz Shabar. Published in the book Lughat al Rizal. Secondly, the Muslims are all obliged to believe in the Gospel, Injil, that Allah revealed to his Prophet Jesus the Messiah, peace be upon him. The one who denies this is a Kafir, disbeliever, according to scholarly consensus. Allah says, Interpretation of the Meaning. And in their footsteps, we sent Isa, son of Maryam, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we gave him the Injil in which was guidance and light and confirmation of the Torah that had come before it, a guidance and an admonition for al mudakan the pious. 546 After the prophets of the Israelites, I sent Jesus, son of Mary, as a believer in the Torah, giving judgment in accordance with it. I also gave him the angel that contained guidance to the truth and evidences to remove doubts and solve difficult cases of rulings. It corresponded to the Torah that came before it, except in a few rulings that it replaced. I made the angel a guide and a means to restrain people from doing that which was prohibited. Almida 46 Our belief in the gospel dictates that we should also believe that it exists, and that it was revealed completely, and we believe that everything that he brought from Allah was true. But there is nothing in Islam to tell us whether this gospel was written and compiled at the time of Isa, peace be upon him, or who wrote it, or who preserved it and disseminated it, or whether the Messiah taught it to the people orally or whether the disciples transmitted it and who believed in it, or whether some of it was written down and some was not. These are questions that we cannot answer for certain nowadays, rather some researchers deny that there was even a true gospel that was compiled in the form of a book. Rather it was just words that were transmitted. The great scholar Al-Tahir Ibn Ashur says in al tahrir Well Tanwir, commenting on the tafsir of Surat al-Imran. With regard to the gospel, this is the name of the revelation that was sent to Isa, peace be upon him, and was compiled by his companions. End quote. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, may Allah have mercy on him, said, We believe sincerely that everything that Isa, peace be upon him, said was revelation from Allah, and that it was the gospel and glad tidings for the children of Israel. But throughout his life, Isa did not write a single word, and he did not order anyone to write anything. Hal al Kitab al Muqaddas Kalamat Allah, is the Bible God's word? But it seems that the Messiah, peace be upon him, knew how to read and write. This may be understood from the words of Allah, interpretation of the meaning. And he, Allah, will teach him, I essay, the book and al-Hikmah, i.e. the Sunnah, the faultless speech of the prophets, wisdom, and the Torah and the Injil. Al-Imran 3.48 Ibn Kathir, may Allah have mercy on him, said, It seems that what is meant by book here is writing. Tafsir al-Quran al azim But we do not have any evidence that the revelation was written down at the time of I essay, peace be upon him. The fact that the Gospel is called, a book, in the Holy Quran does not indicate that it was written down on pages at the time it was revealed.
The fact that it is called a book only refers to that which is with Allah and Allah al mufaz the preserved tablet, or that it was something that could be written. This also applies to the Holy Quran, as Allah calls it a book. Rather it was transmitted verbally as well as being written down randomly on skins and parchments. In fact it was not a compiled book until the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him. Indeed Allah says, interpretation of the meaning. And even if we had sent down unto you, O Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, a message written on paper so that they could touch it with their hands, the disbelievers would have said, this is nothing but obvious magic. 6 colon 7 if we had sent down to you, O messenger, a book written on paper, and they had seen it with their eyes, they would not have accepted it out of stubbornness and denial. And they would have said, What you have brought is nothing more than clear magic, and we will never believe in it. al 7 Al-Tahir Ibn Ashur said in his commentary on Surat Maryam, 30. The scripture refers to the law which is usually written lest it be subject to change. The word scripture is applied to the law of Isa, peace be upon him just as it is applied to the Qur'an. Al-Tariya wal Tanwar. Similarly the Christians do not believe that there is a book that was written by the Messiah or one of his disciples during his lifetime that was lost after that. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, said, As for the gospel that is in their hands, they acknowledge that it was not written by the Messiah, peace be upon him, nor did he dictate it to someone else to write it down. Rather they wrote it after the Messiah was taken up, into heaven. Al-Jawab al, al there is a clear difference between the revelation that was sent down to Musa, peace be upon him, and the revelation that was sent down to Isa, peace be upon him. In the Quran there is an indication that the former was written down, as Allah says, interpretation of the meaning. And we wrote for him on the tablets the lesson to be drawn from all things and the explanation for all things, and said, Hold unto these with firmness, and enjoin your people to take the better therein. I shall show you the home of al fasikun the rebellious, disobedient to Allah. 7 colon 145. Allah wrote for Moses in the tablets everything that the Israelites would need for their spiritual and worldly affairs, instruction for those who would be instructed and an explanation of laws that needed explanation. He told Moses to take hold of them firmly and with determination, and to instruct his people, the Israelites, to take hold of the most excellent instructions that they contained, with the promise of the greatest reward for doing what they were instructed in the most perfect way, and to do so with patience and forgiveness. Allah told Moses that he would show them the destiny of those who went against his commands and who disobeyed him, and the ruin and loss that they would receive as a result. al 175 Although it seems from the words of some Muslim scholars that the true gospel was compiled and written at the time of the Messiah, peace be upon him. You can find this view in the words of Ibn Hazm in Al-Faisal and Ibn Taymiyyah in Al-Jawab Al-Sahih. Similarly it says that the word gospel, Injil, is applied to that which Allah revealed to the Messiah as it says in the Gospel of Mark 8 verse 35. Whoever loses his life for me and for the Gospel will save it. As for the Gospels that are extant nowadays, they are not the true Gospel, but no one can deny that they contain a great deal of the Gospel that Allah revealed to the Messiah, peace be upon him. Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, said, These four books that they call the Gospel, or call each of them a Gospel, were written by them after the Messiah was taken up into heaven, but they do not say in them that they are the Word of God or that the Messiah conveyed them from God. Rather they transmitted in them some of the words of the Messiah, and some of his actions and miracles. They said that they did not narrate from him everything that they heard and saw from him. So they are more akin to what was narrated by the scholars of Hadith, prophetic narrations. Biography and Magatzi battle, reports from the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him of his words and deeds that are not Quran. So the Gospels that they have in their hands are more like the books of Sirah, biographies, and Hadith, prophetic narrations, or like these books, even if most of them are true. Al-Jawab al, al sahih And Allah knows best.